This live stream is brought to you by Still and Evergreen Garden Care. Still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools, backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local Still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hello, welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to be back with you today. It is a glorious day here in Perth in Western Australia. The sun is out, but uh, we've got some pretty cold nights coming our way, and these are going to be the challenges that we all start to experience. So I will be answering your questions today and helping you out in the garden. Now, it's a very exciting show today because so many of you have been asking about our Sproutwell competition. And who is the winner of the $10,000 grand prize. Well, I know that we've got uh, a couple of uh, people waiting in our green room at the moment, and we will be announcing it very, very soon. It's really, really exciting. Now, love is in the air. Well, at least for roses, it's the time of the year to be planting roses. I've actually bought some of my the end of the season varieties in from my garden. They are just gorgeous, but it's the last last bite because the cool wheel, uh, cool weather will send them dormant uh, and that is the perfect time to be planting them out. We'll talk about roses a bit later on. I've got a super special deal for you as well. Of course, this is all about answering your questions. So um, do us a favour, send your questions in. You can always send us things like uh, photos and videos as well. It's always a good thing. We won't probably get them up today, but we will next week, I promise. Um, we've got uh, some great uh, prizes for you as usual, so um, make sure that you uh, give us your best possible question and uh, Sarah will choose our winner. And don't forget, when you are sending through your details, state, the city that you live in um, or town, really important. And always, please, hit the like button if you like what we're doing. It's a great way for you to share this with your friends and build our community. Now. We have received uh, some questions during the week, uh, and that has included some photographs. And the first up is from Victoria. It's Joanne. Good morning to you, Joanne. Wondering if I can help with your indoor plants. The leaves are, are gradually dry, are dying. Now, you went to the shop that you purchased it from, and they said that you'd overwatered it. So you've repotted it in a new potting mix, and you've stopped watering so much and bought a moisture cage. You've done everything you can do, but the leaves are still dying. Let's have a look at this photograph. All right, well, there's your, there's your gauge, your moisture, moisture gauge, whoop, and there you go. Okay, well, interestingly enough, this is a plant that um, generally can handle quite wet conditions. This is the umbrella, and um, typically, unless you had it sitting in water, which is possible in that particular type of pot, um, it wouldn't really have a problem. Now, you've repotted it, and you've, you've given it, I suppose, its best possible chance by... Um, by backing off the water. There is one thing that I would recommend you do, and that's to give it a really good soaking with a seaweed extract. Sea salt is a great product to use. So you could try that. Um, that'll just help try and stimulate the, um, the, the damaged root regrowth. And then you'll see that reflected in the leaves. Remember, it's all happening in the soil. If you get the soil right, everything that happens above will be good. If your soil's not healthy, if it's waterlogged, saturated, if it's been uh, you know, filled full of nutrients, um, you might see burning on leaves. All these things are the sorts of things that cause those sorts of problems, but it should be recovering, Joanne. So just take a deep breath, give it a little bit of time. It may drop its foliage, but it should push out new foliage pretty quickly. Okay, let's stay in uh, Victoria. Uh, Vicky is in Melbourne. Uh, how does a rose, uh, a cardinal rose grow? Well, how big does it? A cardinal rose grow well cardinals actually a big upright hybrid tea variety and uh, they can be as tall as probably two meters um, about this time of the year it's one that you do want to uh, just trim back down a little bit um, during the year and it encourages it to throw up these nice big long runners but of course we are moving into the dormant period of time so it is one of those things where you probably want to be thinking about letting it rest Pruning it uh, depends, Melbourne. Pr 
probably not going to get too many frosts in Melbourne. You could prune in June. Uh, wherever you're in a frosty uh, location, you want to leave it a little bit later. So July, August 1st is a trigger point usually here in WA or in the Perth region of WA anyway. Um, so, yeah, usually it's in July um, and you would prune it back pretty hard at that point in time. And then uh, you get off to a good run with growth coming into the springtime. Lorraine, we're not sure where you're from, except for I suspect it is Victoria because Everybody in Victoria has a problem with possums eating their roses at the moment. Now, there were a couple of really good suggestions put up. If the if the pot, if the roses are in pots, a uh, little bit of Vicks vape, vapor rub around the outside of the um, the rim of the pot will stop the possums crossing over. They don't like it at all. There is a really important message in that though, and, and that is that possums have very sensitive noses. So if you want to stop them from actually eating the rose itself, dust your rose with white pepper. It makes the world of difference, but it'll basically mean they'll sneeze and they'll move away. And you'll, you'll hear them sneezing there. They make quite a loud noise, but they'll move away and they won't go near any of your plants that have been uh, dusted with white pepper. Now you can do it one of two ways. You can just wet the plants down and get the pepper dust out and shake it all over the trees and it'll stick to the foliage and that will stop them coming near. Um, or sometimes you can mix it up in a sprayer and spray it over the foliage as well and then let it dry. That's a bit of a, a bit of a, uh, an old trick for solving problems with possums. All right, let's head up to Queensland. Madeline is in Queensland. How do we stop sedge grass or nut grass in the garden? It's taking over. Now, it really is a significant problem and there are some sort of selective herbicides available, but not varieties that you are going to buy in your local garden centre you'll need to get somebody, a professional in, somebody from say gyms or VIP or one of those lawn care specialists because um, nutgrass is a is a it's one of those things, the big mistake most people make, is they go to pull it out and that just creates another 10 or 20 plants, which is the last thing you want to do. Um, hopefully that helps. I'm sorry, but this is one where you will need a specialist select herbicide and it's not one that you're going to be able to buy from the shelves. Sue is in Victoria. Hello, Sue. We've got some photos. Um, you need help with azaleas. The leaves have got a silvery colour and they've got black spot, uh, brown spots on the back. Have, you've had lots of rain um, and they have been like this for at least eight months. Can I help you? Yes, you have uh, quite a significant attack of probably two things going on here. The silvery foliage is definitely, is definitely um, red spider mite damage or two spotted mite damage. It's the same thing. Um, you could have uh, azalea lace bug also causing some issues there. It's a bit hard to tell. I, I suspect that um, it is red spider mite. The solution is the same for both of them anyway. So a treatment with something like success or um, once upon a time you could use something like Confidor, uh, but it needs to be one of those systemic insecticides and you need to spray the foliage up and under, make sure the plant is thoroughly drenched It'll absorb it into the sap and as it moves through, any of those insects that were not hit in the contact stage will eat the sap and then they will they will die. So, um, yeah, that's the uh, best I can do to help you. But you do need to treat it because it will set your azaleas back badly if you don't. So um, success is is the is the is probably the most common treatment. Um, but if you go into your local garden centre and they say, look, we don't have it, um, you just ask for a systemic, a systemic insecticide, really important. Misty's joining us from Adelaide. I've got a massive outbreak of soursop. How do I get rid of them in an established garden? Okay, Misty, the only way you're going to really get them, get some wet newspaper, spread it around over the top and put some mulch on top of that. The only way to really get rid of soursop, I reckon, the best, best solution without using chemicals is just to mulch it out. And if you do that, you will knock it out but you want a nice probably 80 to 100 mil layer of um of mulch and then um that's got to be on top of newspapers so the newspapers on top mulch is on top of that and you'll smother them out ron is in wa and he sent us a photograph his chili plants have converted to capsicums the capsicums in this image are from my chili seeds let's have a look at this this seems strange okay they're definitely capsicums there's no doubt about it now cap Chilies don't turn into capsicums. So somehow or other, the seed has, there's been a swap over of seed, mate. There's, uh, it's definitely a capsicum plant. Every single um, element of that is capsicum. And um, I would say there's been a mix up of seed. 
So I'm not quite sure how that happened, but it's definitely what you've got there for sure. Uh, Zelko is in South Australia. Hello, Zelko. My elephant ears plant dies has died off leaf by leaf this time of the year. Is that normal? Yes, some of them do. Some of them will die back. Um, generally, it's it's a plant that can stay evergreen and, and produce very large, uh, very you know, very very large leaves as it gets more mature. But um, the generally when they're in an indoor situation um, or you know a, a, in a, under the eaves of a house on the south side of a house you'll find they tend to die back in the cooler conditions, but they tend to bounce back again come springtime. It's just how they are. Hopefully that helps Zelco. It just depends also on the variety that you've got. There's quite a few different varieties. Carol is in Albany. Albany is in the south of Western Australia, one of the most beautiful places. Is it okay to plant fruit trees close to septic systems, including leech strains, or can it damage them? Absolutely, it can damage them, Carol. In fact, I've got two uh, beautiful fig trees uh, in my backyard uh, that I dug out of a garden down in Albany that were planted on top of a leach tank. These figs are probably the worst of all the plants that you could ever put near it. But look, any tree is going to seek out moisture. It's going to send its roots straight towards it. And the problem with septic systems and leach strains is that you end up with a situation where you've got moisture and nutrient in the soil. So it's constantly attracting those roots in you end up getting a big mass of them inside your pipes and inside the system and it clogs it. So keep that area clean of, of any of those kinds of trees. Lynn is in Claremont, that's in WA. Um, good morning, Trev. My daughter who lives in South Fremantle needs some advice, please. She's just planted some native ground covers and would like to know how much water they'll need and should she fertilise them. Any advice would be very helpful. So if they're native ground covers, they should pretty much be able to establish by themselves without any watering at all during the winter months. A bit of controlled release fertilizer, a bit of an osmocote for natives, really good way just to encourage that, that really rapid establishment. Um, basically then watch it during the first summer. If they start to look a bit too dry, because we had a horrendous hot summer, uh, dry summer in WA last summer, if it's like that again, this then you might occasionally need to hand water them. So uh, let's, um, let's just be careful with it. But look, they are native. So they are, you know, generally, um, they've come from our local environment. They are able to adapt to it. Libby is in Victoria. Again, some more photos. Um, I've, I've got two questions about my pots of orchid, or, orchids. Um, two pots started flowering the beginning of April. The other two don't, don't flower too much. Uh, and, until early June, I get what you're saying, right? So you've got cymbidium orchids here, and you can see them. And this is the interesting thing about cymbidiums is that the different varieties will flower at different stages through the year, um, or when I say through the year, through the winter months. A really important um, key point there with cymbidiums. So April's probably the earliest you would normally see. Uh, they can go right through until sort of end of July, August, with some varieties. So you've just got different varieties there. So that's uh, that's um, the question. Of the, another question, one of the pots looks very cluttered with, with orchids. Um, yeah, you can split them, but wait until they finish flowering and then literally get a hand saw out, um, pull them out of the pot, literally cut it in half and cut about 20% off the bottom of the root system, then repot them in the one in the original pot and put another one in another pot. Now, use your specialist orchid potting mix, but make sure it's the coarse potting mix. So you've got a fine and a coarse, you want the coarse. Keep your eye for that. Okay, hopefully that helps Libby. Staying in Victoria, Judy's in Bendigo. G'day Judy. The rain this week means I can't finish the garden area. I was preparing my 15 bare rooted roses. Can I plant these in pots and then transplant into the garden later in the spring? Absolutely, absolutely, definitely. Um, they'll do very well in pots and, and putting them into a good potting mix will actually get them off to the best possible start. So you really can't go wrong there. I think you're um, you're on track. We are certainly getting a lot of Rose questions flowing through at the moment. Um, now, Sandy's got a good question. With so much rain and so much water, is it a waste of time to fertilise? And the answer to that, Sandy, is it's if your soil is sodden, then you do not want to fertilise because you've got no drainage and there's no way for the, the nutrient to pass through and pass the roots. If nutrients sitting on the surface, you'll end up with a salty crust on the surface and it'll burn off a lot of the plants that are on the surface. So um, you need things to dry out a bit is the answer to that. 
Certainly controlled release fertilizers are the way to go. So things like Osmocote, really good way to go, but you just gotta be careful. All right, well, this is that exciting moment. Let's just do a drum roll. We are being joined right now by Clayton from Spratwell Greenhouses. Clay, g'day, mate. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Yourself? Yeah. How's the weather there today? Oh, uh, haven't been outside too much, but it's obviously not <laughs> as good as it is in Perth, but, you know. <laughs> well, we've had, some pretty, we've had some pretty wet conditions here. That's why I'm celebrating it, uh, the sun being out yeah. today. Mate, we've, we've had um, phenomenal uh, interest in this competition. So many people have been asking who won it. And um, we are, well, I suppose we are looking at something that's a really amazing prize. So we've got a sprout or greenhouse or glass house valued at $8,000. Tell us a little bit about the, the greenhouse or glass house that somebody could be getting. Yeah, well, I guess the the main criteria is you get to spend that, you know, $8,000 worth of value and it doesn't necessarily need to be all greenhouse. It can be accessories. So, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a greenhouse for growing. You might choose something that's a, an outdoor room slash growing space. So we've done it that way. Rather than picking a product, we've chosen a value so that the person that does win can, you know, choose what suits their needs and desires the most. Now, um, obviously, this time of the year is the time to be getting a, a particularly a glass house in because if you're in really cool conditions, you can continue growing things completely out of season, really, can't you? hundred percent. You can do mm. so many great things and it, it just provides that perfect environment for your plants. Like even here in Victoria, we can grow, you know, ginger and pineapples and things like that in our climate that, you know, you'd never dream of. So it's um, fantastic for extending that season through the cool months. Now, mate, we are going to add on top of this a, um, so it'll be your, one of your greenhouses or glass houses or some of the accessories, plus the garden gurus are going to throw in $2,000 worth of garden tools, some soil and some plants to get you started. Now, it's an amazing price, $10,000. It's huge. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. That's like, that gets you up and running pretty good and, um, yeah, it's massive value, to be honest. We've run we've run a competition like this once before in the past, and uh, I know I ran into the lady a couple of years later who won, and she said it changed her life. She said it literally, it got her into the garden more, got her kids involved and things, and her family was eating so much more fresh produce that they had, you know, had really got growing and got started all in the, in the um, greenhouse at the time. I think it was the Grande... Um, uh, six by four. I could be wrong, mate. In in your uh, catalogue. Yeah. 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 That's, and, that's um, one of the range. It's pretty popular. It, yeah. It was. It was so such a such a um, uh, you know fantastic prize for a, for a family to get. So in in our green room at the moment, um, we have got uh, Adam Hobbs. Adam, if you want to um, press your uh, your mute button, um, mate. Yes. Um, you you wrote to us and sort of said that. Um, your favourite episode of The Garden Gurus, one that inspired you, was the North Perth Community Garden episode. Yeah. Yeah, it was tell, a fantastic episode. So mm. tell us, what is it, you know, is, is it sort of um, the idea of getting into the community gardens that um, that worked for you? Yeah, and how people were uh, dealing with the, the lockdowns and COVID and not being able to connect and see each other so that they could at least do it through the garden, even if, you know, the, the, the people weren't there. Yeah. Um, being in Victoria, we went through a lot of that. So it was, it was lovely to sort of, it felt like, you know, a bit of solidarity, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I think it's a great thing about community gardens. There's one thing that's better than community gardens and that's being able to have a, have a beautiful big garden of your own full of um, fresh produce, et cetera. And I've got some really good news for you, mate. You are our winner. Congratulations. <laughs> Yippee. <laughs> well done. How good is that, hey? Well oh. done. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, it's <laughs> nuffed. <laughs> well, nuffed. You, touched, you, you touched all our hearts here because, um, you know, we think that those community gardens are fabulous, but we knew that this would be a bit of a life changer for the person who really appreciated it. So congratulations. Oh, guys, thank you so much. Oh, I'm over the moon, really. And, and Glenn and everyone at Sproutwell and all of your gurus, we've, we've always tuned in. It was, uh, it was fantastic. <laughs> what, what a great prize. Now, we are going to get in contact with you straight after the show. 
um, oh. and connect you and Clayton to uh, to get started and we'll organise our goodies to come your way pretty soon as well, mate. Well, well oh. done. Just congratulations. What a, what a life changer that yeah. one is. Eh? Thank you so much, guys. Over the moon. <laughs> Well done. Uh, we're going to want to see plenty of, plenty of posts of what you do in this greenhouse, yeah, that's for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well, thanks very much, Clayton. What a great prize, mate. You um, you were absolutely, you know, a champ when you came on board with this. It is our 20th anniversary of, of the Garden Gurus on Channel 9. And, you know, we've been with you guys for so long since you guys got started. And you're such a great family business. We really appreciate you supporting this too, Clay. Yeah. So. Thank you to, nice to, to you and all of your team. Cheers. Thanks a lot for that. It's um, yeah, good to be involved. Uh, look, look at Adam. He's absolutely beside <laughs> himself. Looks, well done, mate. He, all looks, right. he looks a bit excited and nervous. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, well done. That's uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. On, mate. All right. Okay. Well, listen. We could stay and talk to Adam, I think, for ages, but I'm, I would like to do a follow-up with him a little bit later because I think it will be very interesting to have a look at what he gets growing in his in his greenhouse. You can see the, the passion there and and maybe you can bring, uh, bring some of those things into your local community garden too, Adam. Well done, mate. Now, I, I do need to keep moving because we have got a lot of, uh, a lot of questions flowing through and I've got a lot to get through. I, I did... Um, I did, and I want to show you this. I did bring these roses in. Now, they are just at the end of the season, but these are just some of the last remnants of colour and spectacular fragrance. How good? Have a smell of that. Is that good? That's good. That's uh, Robin in the background there, just, just letting you know that the fragrance from these is incredible. And growing your own roses at home is something that we should... I, look... I love growing them um, in my garden. I've always had space for them because they are such a productive plant. And there are some roses that certainly perform better than others. There's no doubt about it. So we spoke to our friends at Garden Express and said to them, look, Trev's going to talk about roses and how they're going into dormancy. They said, well, look, we've got uh, the beginning of the season with the bare-rooted roses coming through. I think we talked briefly um, last week to Rowan about it, and they are ready. So he's put together an amazing offer, and it's two collections. So it's a favourites collection, which includes um, the beautiful hybrid tea rose, Papa Meeland, um, the, the, probably the best rose that you can ever grow, Iceberg, um, absolutely wonderful Florabunda rose variety, and then two hybrid teas, that's Mabella and Jacaranda. Jacaranda's got that um, wonderful Jacaranda blue sort of, um, uh, yes, blue mauvey sort of colour um, to it in its flower. Um, two of those are wonderfully fragrant and two of them are incredibly prolific. So um, you've got uh, got a lot of colour coming your way. And that's collection number one. Collection number two is the bicolour collection. Now, this has got some of the best roses you will ever get your hands on. Double Delight, that's the hybrid tea. Joyfulness, which is a beautiful big rose. And of course, Peace being um, such a significant um, rose variety um, selection coming out of World War II. Um, and it's a big part of, of many, many gardens. I've got Peace at home, I love it. And there's another one, Princess de Monaco. Now that is a lovely hybrid tea as well. So four in each collection. Collection number one, um, that's the favorites collection. $53 for that collection of four roses. That's ridiculous. Saves you $25, uh, 25%. And then collection number two, the bicolor collection, $57, saving 25%. These are amazing rose bushes. And of course, the thing with this is that you plant them in the dormant season. That way um, the, they can be dug up. You can see them here. They can then be put into a bucket of water, um, let the roots rehydrate and then put into the garden. They'll get established in the springtime and by sort of summertime, you'll be in, you'll literally be harvesting flowers. So, you know, probably around about December, um, you start to see these beautiful, classically long stemmed flowers starting to emerge. And um, it's, it's very, very quick. Now, there's a couple of little things that people are going to throw at us today. For those states that are suffering it, and WA is probably the worst hit, there are some, uh, there's a, a, a thrip out there called the chili thrip. It's an introduction that's come from Asia and uh, does a fair bit of damage to a lot of plants. Roses in particular can be really badly affected. And the best treatment for it is, again, a systemic 
insecticide. Now, you can use Success. I've used it, and uh, what I find is a combination treatment. So you don't ever use one chemical by itself, otherwise they have this ability to start to build up resistance. But at the beginning of the season, spray them as they start to grow, or spray them as the flowers start to mature, and then when you've gone through and cut your first lot of flowers, spray them after that, and you will not have chili thrip problems at all, I promise you. Uh, it's all about breaking the cycle with, with all thrips. Um, and flower strips are the worst. So how do we go? It's a good deal that, isn't it? It's a pretty amazing deal, to be quite honest. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few more tips on things to do with um, with um, your roses and how to get good results at home a bit further on in the show. I might just fly into answering some questions because uh, the team here today uh, are answering a lot or they've got a lot coming through. Now, let's have a look at this. Phil's in Queensland. He sent us a photograph. I've had this plant for eight months. However, it doesn't seem to be growing. How can I fix it? Let's have a look at this photo. It's not that photo. It's this photo. Now, I, from your photograph, I couldn't quite pick it. It looks to me like it could be a Lagostromia speciosa, the, 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 the queen flower or queen of flowers, it's known as. But I'm not 100% sure. It's just a little bit difficult to pick. What it does look like it's had is a little bit of thrip damage to some of the new foliage. Um, what also it looks like it needs desperately is a really, really good feed. It's looking yellow. And I reckon the key to this to get the growth is going to be applying some fertilizer on a really regular, on a like quite regular basis. Um, so something like this is one of those sort of um, what, what, what we would describe as a gross feeding plant. So it'll, it'll actually require more nutrient on a regular basis. So possibly first up, giving it a hit with some uh, with a liquid fertilizer would be the best thing you could do. So over the foliage itself, and at exactly the same time, a controlled release fertilizer. And I would do the same thing two months down the line. Now, most controlled release fertilizers are between two and, uh, sorry, between four and six months. Um, I'd be looking at a general controlled release Osmocoat um, that's about a four month application, but for the first six months, I would every two months give it another handful. You need to build the nutrient, um, you know, the, the level of nutrient up in the soil, and this plant will appreciate it. It will take off and start to grow, and it'll use all those nutrients to really get going. All you need to do is just break the, the lethargy, and once it's, once it's on its move, once it gets moving, it'll be really on its way and you won't stop it. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Danielle in Queensland, how do I stop bush turkeys attacking my citrus? Well, that is a big problem. Um, you know what? The, 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 I was talking about it before, but the pepper trick is a really effective way to do it. You can do the same thing with chilli, and it, it seems to be really effective in keeping um, citrus aphids away, gall wasp away. But uh, the combination of, of crushed chilli, dry chilli crushed, uh, mixed in, uh, in a sprayer, put a little bit of olive oil in there and then put maybe four to six tablespoons of white pepper in there, mix it all up and then spray it over the foliage. That'll stop them. They sneeze when they get to it. Um, and as I said, that's probably not a bad little natural solution for a lot of pests. So um, good one to go for. Hopefully that helps, Danielle. Um, let's go to Southern Sydney. How close to my house can I plant an ornamental grapevine? I want to grow it over a pergola. Um, actually, Look, grapes don't have the most intensive root system, believe it or not. So they're not generally any threat at all to um, to foundations of houses, to concrete pads and things like that. You won't have any problem there. If you stick it on top of a, you know, a um, sump or something like that, it will get its roots in there, that's for sure. But uh, as long as you're free of sumps, so probably you want it to be at least 500 off the wall. But if you can have it 500 off the wall, that should be all you need to... Um, need to, to worry about because it won't grow under the house. It'll chase moisture out in the garden. So the root system will grow into the garden in preference to um, getting into uh, your foundations. Hopefully that helps. Remember, it's really important, folks. Tell us where you are from. Um, Edwina sent us a note through this morning. Uh, didn't tell me where you're from, though. But good morning. I, I have iceberg roses that are 25 years old. My mum planted them when I had my very premature daughter. They need to be moved to a sunnier position. Could you advise me on how to do this without them dying? All right, Edwina, the good news is winter is the time to do it. Um, if I knew exactly where you were, I'd tell you exactly when to do it, but I'm gonna give you a general. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to be thinking about this um, 
for them to be the most dormant that they can be. So middle of middle of July, um, dig around the outside of the roses. Um, they should be completely dormant. Prune them right back down to to as close to the, the the graft as you possibly can. But you still want framework, so you still don't want to don't want to wreck them. But you do want to prune them back really really hard. Then dig around the outside, leave them for a week, give them a bit of a soak with some sea soil, then dig them out of the ground and move them to their new home. Now they need to be in full sun. Really important. Roses love a bright sunny position. And again, um, depending on where you where you live would determine how far apart they need to be planted. So if you're in Sydney or anywhere further north and you've got high humidity, you want to have really good gaps between your roses, at least seven 800 mils, ideally even a metre between them. This allows for ventilation through, which reduces disease. Um, if, you're, if you're in Perth where it's hot and dry, it's not so much of an issue. 500 is probably wide enough. Hopefully that helps. Keith is in Moorbank in New South Wales. Hi, Keith. Thanks for joining us. Uh, since we're entering the winter soon, what's a good time to trim some mango trees and how much foliage do you trim? Most are as high as a two-storey building. Wow, you've got some really big mangoes, Keith. The only thing is it's not a good time to prune mangoes going into winter. Mangoes get a disease called anthracnose and it's spread, spreading cold conditions through the plant really quickly. And if you prune it, you leave these open wounds and that's where anthracnose gets in and causes dieback in the plant. So you really want to do this in the summertime and you ideally want to do it immediately after they've fruited. So as soon as they've fruited, you can prune them and you can probably take anything up to 20% off the tree and maybe some select branches in the middle that, that are crossing over each other, etc. cetera. Um, but that's, they're big trees, two-story buildings. They're getting pretty solid. So um, yeah, wait until summertime, wait until they've fruited and then give them a prune. Somebody was very critical of me uh, recently on social media for mentioning that um, mangoes fruit in the autumn. And you'll have to excuse me, but... I'm always basing it on my own garden, but if you're in really, if you're in far northwestern Australia or far north um, uh, Queensland, uh, your mangoes are a summer fruiting plant. If you're down in Melbourne, and I know people with, with mangoes in Melbourne, um, your your mangoes will actually uh, fruit pretty much right on the verge of, or you'll be harvesting right on the verge of winter. So um, that's, that's the challenge we have here when we're giving you advice is that we're a big country, We've got five or six different climatic zones that we work with. So your your information is vitally important to me, giving you the right advice. Okay, let's keep moving. Krista is in Ballarat in Victoria, having trouble striking cuttings of clematis. Done some intern cuttings, used hormone gel for some and honey for others, and they're on a heated mat in a window. Well, they should be dormant at the moment. Um, so you what you really want to do is get your cuttings in when they're dormant, and then um, during the winter, uh, you could have the, the heat mat on. You're not going to get a lot of growth and you do risk drying the soil out a little bit around the, the, the stems as they callus. In saying that, um, sort of around, if you do this around about August, um, I'll guarantee you you'll have success every time because they do strike exceptionally well that time of the year. And with a bit of heat mat underneath it, they should do very well. So it's just about consistent moisture for them uh, whilst you're getting them done. So hopefully that helps. Krista, try them in August. Liz is in Sydney. Hello, Liz. I've got a leggy sage that's being attacked by caterpillars. If I prune it back now, is it likely to recover? Should I just deal with the leggy bits um, after the weather, until the weather warms up? Yeah, well, look, the answer is get into them, give them a prune now. It won't hurt them. Um, as long as you're not getting frost. If you're out at Windsor or somewhere like that, um, you can get those really terrible frosts. Definitely don't prune it if you're in that situation. But if you're in Sydney in the city, um, then you'll, you'll be fine. So, um, you know, I would suggest that um, give, them a, give them a prune now and you'll be okay. Sorry, uh, Jimmy and I are sharing power cords today because I didn't bring mine in with me. Sorry, I didn't want to disappear suddenly. Um, okay, Barbara is in Queensland. Hello, Barbara. Hi, I've got a dwarf mulberry tree. It's lost all its leaves now. Do I need to do anything from now to spring to ensure I get a good crop? Um, is there anything I should do? It's the first time I'm having this tree. You know what, Barbara, if it's a dwarf mulberry tree, it's probably a chartreuse, probably a red dwarf. Absolutely fabulous tree. And you don't have to do anything. All we need to do now is let Mother Nature do what she does best. 
and that's let them rest. So as long as it's not, you know, being um, saturated or damaged or, you know, shaded out by something else, leave it. It'll be fine. It'll be really, really good. Now let's go to Sydney. We've got a lot of questions coming in from Sydney. Karen, I've got three to four year old grafted tation lime with lots of lovely green growth, I think that is, but never any fruit. Is it is in a sunny spot and it's fed with black magic citrus fertilizer. It's interesting. Back the fertilizer off, right? So I've got um I've got a Tahitian lime that's a little too close to some bananas, and I feed the bananas quite regularly. And I'm getting lots and lots of growth on it, very little fruit. So I'm about to prune it back really hard, really, really hard. I'm pretty much going to bring it right back just to a, a framework, let it start to grow. Then as those new shoots come out, I'm going to go through and trim those back so that I retain a very, very bushy, lower growth habit for my Tahitian lime. I'd recommend you do something similar. Mine's probably about eight years old. So it's about double the age of yours. But um, don't feed it. Don't feed it and back the water off. Um, in this case, um, fruit trees, and this is the, the logic with fruit and flower, um, they produce flowers and they produce fruit because they want to reproduce. Uh, they want to continue the, the generations on. If they're getting lots and lots of nitrogen, lots and lots of water, um, they put on growth. They won't put on flower or fruit because they're not concerned. It's all about growing into the biggest possible tree they can be. So hopefully that helps. Every week we get joined um, by a, a great friend out of Baronia in Victoria, Tyson. And Tyson's always planting seeds. This week he wants to know about the red Russian kale seeds in your garden bed. Um, can you plant them? Can I give you some tips? Well, now is the time to plant any of the brassicas. So, um, you know, kale, cauliflower, cabbage, they can all go in this time of the year. Um, it's got to be in a nice, bright, sunny position. And you've got to ideally be planting them into sandy soil, Tyson, if you want to get really good results. Now, if you don't have sandy soil, if your soil's heavier, you can introduce some sand and literally run it in rows or, or depending on how heavy your soil is, or into channels. Um, and then plant your seed into that. And what will happen is it will germinate really quickly through the sand, drop its roots down and grab hold of that good soil and settle itself in. So hopefully that helps. But full sun, don't put any fertiliser in the soil, just put your seeds in. You can't go wrong, Tyson, now's the time to be doing it. Okay, 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 okay. Christine is in Bustleton in W. I don't know if you've been to Bustleton, if you've been over here in the west, beautiful part of WA and has a lot of um, what is known as the peppermint trees, the WA weeping peppermint tree. Now, they are a beautiful tree, but they have uh, quite a very high oil content in the leaf and they do drop a lot of leaves. So they have a, a regular sort of mulch around the base of them. And the interesting thing is that the, that oil from the leaf will literally neutralize any other seed. So nothing else will grow around the base of them. And Christine is asking, what can I plant under them? So whatever you put in, don't put it in by seed. There's a lot of ground covers. So there's a lot of people that are quite successful growing things um, underneath that are sort of more mature ground coverish sort of plants. Um, there's also things like uh, the, the broader leaf foliage plants that come from the rainforest. So philodendron xanadu is a good example of a plant that um, you can mass plant underneath. Things like, um, uh, camellias, azaleas, uh, they generally struggle in that sort of environment for some strange reason. So, yeah, it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that you, you look at those broader leaf. And look, always drop into your local garden centre and ask them for a little bit of advice. It's always a great way to go. Now, if you've been spending any time in the garden at the moment, it's probably been raking up leaves or possibly getting the blower back out to blow them back in. And, you know, in the valley where I live, the roar of the engines that are, that are blowing um, leaves and cleaning up is it's deafening, usually on a Saturday and Sunday morning, not necessarily the best time to have motorised garden equipment out. But technology has changed massively and uh, the people who are at the forefront of that are still. So I popped into my local still store and asked them about the battery technology that's changing everything.
Chris, everything's changed, hasn't it? You know, it's one of those areas where it was all about, you know, the engine size, really, the motor and driving that power. But now we've got batteries and it's transforming everything. Definitely. Definitely battery is the way to go. Yeah. It's, it's taking everything by storm. It's, um, in some cases, lighter mm -hmm. than a petrol machine, a lot less maintenance uh, and more user friendly. And um, probably from the point of view of neighbours with motors ringing out in the, you know, through the valley in the mornings and stuff like that, they don't have to worry about that. These are pretty quiet machines as a general comment. They can be quiet machines. Mm -hmm. Some machines do still have a little bit of, bit of noise, mm -hmm. but in general they are a lot quieter. Now, you've got three different battery systems. So just to explain to people, one's a built-in. One's a built-in, that's your AI rate, which mm -hmm. is an 18 volt. Mm -hmm. Then you go up to your AK. Uh, it's a 36 volt, that's Just more for your... Smaller battery. Small, about half the size, more square looking. Mm -hmm. um, that's more for your sort of medium sized yards. Yep. Then once you get into something with a bit of acreage, a bit of a bit of property, you're better for that AP, which is your pro. Bigger fuel cell, longer run times. Yep. So I, I've got the APs at my place because I've got a, a bit of acreage there and they're absolutely fantastic. There's so many features with these too. So if you're not sure about you know how much power you've got, all right, this battery's almost empty, time to go on charge. Definitely. Um, how long does it take to charge a battery as a general comment? A general rule, about an hour. Right. Some batteries with larger capacity might take a little bit longer, but yeah. as a rule, about an hour, just over an hour. Terrific. All right, and now you can get it in pretty much everything. You've got chainsaws, you've got hedge trimmers, blowers, everything. Everything, everything. We even do a garden sprayer. For your, for your your pesticides or whatever, it comes fully battery operated. Wow. Who would have imagined batteries could change everything? It really is quite incredible technology. And for those of you that may have some doubts in your mind, how long the batteries last or anything else, I'm finding that I'm going to my battery powered equipment now. Um, ahead of going for some of the, the, the motor-driven um, machines that I've got in my workshop. And um, it's purely because of the convenience and the fact that they do last so long. Very rarely do I ever do a job that's that long. That And I've got a big property that um, I need to use two batteries. So if you've got a couple, you it's more than enough um, to run the lawnmower, the line trimmer and the blower back, for example. Um, incredible technology. Now, I, I mentioned the plant of the week earlier on. Um, last chance really to get roses in and the guys from um, Garden Express, they are falling apart now, but um, the guys from Garden Express were absolutely fantastic in coming up with that rose offer today. But you know, there's so many beautiful roses, uh, Papa Meland, uh, um, a lot of a lot of the David Austin roses are still performing in my garden. So um, I've got a couple here just to give you an example, but just so beautifully fragrant. And bringing this in at the end of the season really does lift the spirits in the household. If, you, uh, if you've if you been one of those people that has spent a lot of time in lockdown, then growing things like roses is a good way to go. And because, you know, they, they to get a decent rose plant, um, it takes two years minimum before they go into a pot to go into the nursery where you would pay for them. If you buy them bare rooted, um, you don't, you avoid that and you end up saving a lot of money. So makes a lot of sense to one, take advantage of that. Now two, if you are, oh, I suppose it doesn't just matter with roses, it also things like gardenias, azaleas, camellias, this is the time of the year to be repotting all of those plants um, and getting them established really for the springtime when they'll hit their, their peak. So they'll really start flowering strongly from the beginning of spring right through until sort of November, December uh, for most of those plants. So. Getting the best results from them requires one thing in common. You need to have slightly acidic growing conditions. Now, um, that's a pretty important uh, thing that you've got to get right in your soil. And if, you, if you've got a garden where your soil is alkaline, for example, or too acidic, um, you can end up with problems. If, you, if you've got a, a, a situation where you can't control that soil, what you can do is you can actually get um, a, a specialised potting mix and put them into that potting mix. So um, people at Evergreen, Scott, Sosmacote, um, they have uh, developed a formula of rose gardenia, azalea, and camellia potting mix. And it's not just for those, it's also rhododendrons, magnolias, daphne, they all love this potting mix, it, but it's a specialized mix and it's really important you ask for it. 
Now, it'll also have that special osmocote in it that distributes nu nutrients over a six month period, which is really important. If you have the wrong soil, if your soil is too alkaline and you're looking at those plants at the moment, you're probably seeing some yellowing um, of the foliage, whether it be you know, deep green veins or just general yellowing or lack of sort of uh, vivid sort of green energy coming through that foliage. And you'll see that they drop flower buds very quickly. It's the other thing that's a big giveaway. So this particular potting mix covers all those things. It's got boosted you know, levels of iron and magnesium as well. So you end up sort of fixing any problems with, with light green foliage. Um, it's got wetting agents. It's got water crystals. And of course, you know, what goes into the engineering of these potting mixes to make them work is really quite remarkable. But professional growers, that's where these formulas come from. They've been designed and, and created for professional growers, the people who are growing the plants that you're buying from the garden centre and putting into your garden. So to be able to get your hands on the soil that makes the difference for, for those plants in your garden environment, that's pretty unique. So keep your eye out for it. It's Scott's Osmocote, Rose Gardenia, Azalea and Camellia Mix. It covers all of those, along with those other ones I mentioned, Rhododendrons, Magnolias, Daphne, they're all things we should be planting this time of the year. All right, well, should we um, should we keep rolling on with uh, some questions, do you think? I think we should. And remember, please send us your, um, send us your location. Now, this next question is a really good example. Kath, I don't know where you are from, but I really, really want to know because one of the plants that I have always dreamed of growing and producing fruit, now I've grown them but never got the fruit, is the giant granadilla. If you don't know what the giant granadilla is, it's a giant passion fruit. Um, now, Kath sent through a photograph and she's showing the fruit. You can see there's a bucket of it. See the size of it? Now, she's got some spots on the bottom of the fruit um, and they get right deep into the flesh. Now, this is a little bit different. It's it's a sweet passion fruit. So it's not that sort of um, tangy passion fruit flavor we're necessarily used to. It's a little bit different. And these are huge. Sometimes they're the size of a football. So you can see there, there's a hand. These are just enormous fruit. Now, the ones that she's she's got um, with these spots on, they're getting something called pseudomonas. It's a, it's a type of spotted rot in the base of the, of the, the fruit. And it's not an unusual thing when you've had really wet conditions. So I'm starting to lean towards believing, Kath, that you're probably from Brisbane or, or Queensland anyway, I would think, maybe northern New South Wales. But I could be wrong. So please, this is why it's important for you to tell us. Um, the treatment for this rot is, is something called um, cosite. Now, it is a copper-based fertilizer. Cupric hydroxide is the active ingredient. And what it does is it really does a great job um, in just clearing off any of those spot diseases. Um, so um, I think we're having some problems at the moment with um, images popping up on the feed. Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, look, it, it's we'll do our best on that side of things. But look, this is an amazing passion for it. If you, you know, if Perth's too cool and it's probably on the right on the cusp, um, certainly, you know, further north, Geraldton, uh, probably Sydney north, you will be able to grow this fruit and it is remarkable. So hopefully um, I've been able to help a little bit with that. Cosite is the spray and that'll just clean off those spots for you um, just as the fruit's developing. Paul's in Southern Sydney. When's the best time to prune my fig tree? Um, no better time than right now, Paul. Once it's dropped its foliage, give it a good prune. Um, don't don't hit it too hard, but but figs can be pruned quite quite hard and, and end up producing great fruit. Rena, um, we're not sure where you're from, Rena. Uh, I believe this is an Australian native tree. I like the name of it. Okay, let's have a look at this because I haven't seen this particular um, photograph. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm going to see something pop up. I can't see the photograph. Oh, here. Oh, okay. So there we go. So this is known, and it's a shame we're not sure where you're from, uh, Rena, but this is known as the Albany woolly bush, Adenanthus. It's a beautiful plant, a lovely shrub, makes a, um, a great Aussie Christmas tree. And you will get it um, typically around about November, somewhere between sort of August and November, you'll get it in most garden centers. It's quite popular these days. 
so, yeah, if you could let us know where you're from, it will make my life a little bit easier and try to recommend where you get your hands on it. Teller is in Leadville in New South Wales. Hi, Teller joins us every week. Thanks for your support. Um, the last leaf has fallen from my crepe myrtles. Would it be a good time to transplant or wait a little bit longer? As soon as they've dropped their foliage, they're dormant. They've gone to sleep. Teller, now is the time to be digging them out and moving them around if they're in the wrong spot. So, yes, get out and and, uh, and transplant it. They do transplant pretty well. Um, it does take them a couple of years to fully recover. Um, get as much of the root system out as you can when you do it. Benny's in Wagga Wagga in New South Wales, um, and he's joined us via YouTube. Hi, Trev. My hedges are struggling with black scale. I also have a heap of black ants in the garden. What, what plan would you recommend to deal with those issues? Okay, well... Mate, the, the first thing is that ants are farming the scale. So the reason you, the ants are there in large numbers is the scale's producing this um, this little, uh, what would you call it? Um, it's a sugary substance. Um, it'll come to call honeydew. And uh, the ants are feeding off it. And in return, the ants are farming the scale and moving it around to all the fresh growth. So the ants, to some extent, are your problem. Um, and then treating the scale is going to be the second thing. So first thing, try and find where the ants' nests are, talcum powder the, the, the death out of them, and you'll find the ants will move on. You can treat them. There are chemicals to treat, obviously, ant nests, and certainly getting control of them will get control of the scale. The second thing is treating the scale. Once you have got control of the ants, you need to soak your hedges in white oil. Really, really important. Now, there's eco oil, there's... Um, all sorts of horticultural oils. It doesn't really matter. It needs to be an oil based and you need to drench the plant. Okay, so it needs to be fully covered. Then you leave it for two weeks and then you do it again. You leave it for two weeks and you do it again. And at the end of that, you should have cleaned off the vast majority of the scale. It might still be there, but it'll be dead. It won't be alive. And that's the important thing we're trying to do is to smother it out. So then I'd watch, I'd leave it for six months and give them another treatment again, probably the same thing every two weeks for, for a period of six weeks. Um, that should get control of the scale pretty darn well pretty quickly. Prue is in Brisbane. And uh, again, Prue has sent through some photographs. Uh, I don't think it's that one. I don't think it's that one. I think it's this one. Now, Prue, I wasn't quite sure what this plant was. This is definitely a climber. Um, it kind of looks like Petria volvulus. The, um, to me, it looked like the purple wreath vine. But this problem that they've got is really unique. This looks to me very much like a significant problem with a shortage of something like molybdenum or possibly even zinc in the soil. It's a very unusual um, spotting of the plant to see that sort of colour. The solution, without doubt, is going to be getting... Um, is going to be getting the, the foliage um, to colour up again. And it's probably going to drop that foliage and push out new foliage. So you need to, one, feed it. Two, is you need to get trace elements into the soil and quite quite a solid treatment of, of trace elements at the maximum level recommended. And I'd follow it up another month later and do it again because there's, there is a significant issue. That's not a disease as such. That is, that is a shortage of, of a, a central trace element mineral. Um, so don't worry about it being a fungus or anything like that. Um, you've, you've described this as your Fra Fraser Coast vine. I'm still not 100% sure that's what it is to me. But anyway, look, um, hopefully that will help a little bit because um, it's definitely not stress. It's definitely not anything other than a, um, a trace element deficiency. And, and if you've had a lot of rain, that may be flushing your trace elements through. So hopefully... Uh, Hopefully this turns it around for you pretty quick. Prue, um, great question. Really, really good question. Helen's in Narracourt in South Australia. I planted garlic cloves in March. They're growing well. You've mulched them. Uh, what can you do to ensure large cloves at harvest time? And the answer is let them grow. Give them sunlight. Leave them. Wait until they basically start to yellow. The foliage starts to yellow and then harvest. That's what you do. Um, you don't need to do anything else. As long as they've got lots of sunlight and a bit of room for themselves, those bulbs will swell right at the end of the season. And it's literally the foliage, when you see it yellow, all the goodness is going down that foliage into the bulb, swelling them out, and, and then you're fine. So um, hopefully that helps. Okay. 
Let's have a bit of a look here. Where are we? Linda in Hobart, photo attached. Oh dear, I've given my ornamental passion three lots of chelate now and it still has yellow leaves. So this is iron chelate, chelate you are, you're referring to. Um, it's now in flower, but it looks ugly. Maybe it needs fertilizer. So I'm going to have a look at that photograph. And yeah, and you've got a um, you've got an ornamental passion fruit there. So that's um, it's looking hungry, and it's certainly not it's certainly not a an iron deficiency there. It looks to me like it's just general nutrient. So I would be giving it a really good feed, um, a good all round fertilizer. And right at the moment, um, you probably want a fast release, not a slow release. So you could go for one of those animal manure based fertilizers, which would um, will give a bit of a boost immediately and then sort of a slower feed a little bit further down the line. You can't go wrong. So um, give it a lot of a lot of love. That's all it needs. Linda doesn't need um, the, the chelates on their own. It probably needs um, more of a complete fertilizer. And pull those old leaves off too. That'll help. Elise, um, unknown, uh, you've joined us from YouTube. I'm not sure where you're from. Trevor, you had a segment on the Garden Gurus where you spoke about a tube, tubular that helped with regulating blood sugar and fats. Do you remember what it was? You took of a bite of it raw. Okay, so it's a it, it's a um, it is a tuberous plant. Yes, that is correct. It's called yacon, and it's spelt Y A C O N. Now it's a member of the sunflower family, and they'll be going dormant at the moment. So they go dormant during the winter, and now's the time when you harvest. The tubers, which grow off the root, so they're a modified root, they grow down into the soil, and you'll start to see them pop up on the top, those ones that are ready for harvesting. So lifting them and planting them is a really good idea uh, about now. So uh, you can't go wrong if you're harvesting, but planting, you don't really need to do anything. Now, what makes Yarkon so special is it has a non-soluble polysaccharide, a type of sugar, and when you ingest it, it binds with the sugars in your stomach and it takes them out. So it actually reduces um, your blood sugar levels. At the same time, um, it seems to get your body working, your metabolism working. And so you start losing weight because it's taking all the sweetness out. And um, it's really good as, uh, you know, as something to help you reduce your overall weight levels. So Yarkon is the name of it. If you're wondering where you'll get it from, um, I'm going to say online, probably somebody like Daly's Fruit Tree Nursery they could help you. It'd be worthwhile Googling it. Franny is in Adelaide. Hi, Franny. Franny's a supporter of ours from way back. Thank you. I've got a weeping fig that's outgrowing the pot. Replanting it in a new pot would be impossible. The roots have gone into the ground. I attach a photo. I was wondering if I can cut them, cut that stem bulging out of the mass. I was thinking of placing a metal band around the bottom of the pot. Oh, yes. Okay. That's definitely, definitely gone ballistic now what you're going to have to do is you are going to have to cut that out because there's not a lot of garden bed there and, and that tree will fill full of roots um you're probably going to have to go up at least two or three sizes in um, pot size and the initial reaction that this tree will have to you cutting those roots is going to be that it's going to drop pretty much all of its roots which will all of its leaves which will mean you have to trim the tree back as well so you might as well jump in right up front trim it back really hard into a tight little sort of frame and then cut the, the root system and then repot it. And uh, the, the natural thing with figs is that they will send their roots out and seek out um, water wherever they can. So, yeah, interesting problem. Not one that's commonly seen, but not an uncommon experience for people who grow weeping figs. All right. Thanks, Franny. Glenn, you're in the Gold Coast. You've sent us a photograph. Many thanks for your great advice, Trev. Um, I've got this spit like eggs i guess on my blueberries can you tell me what it is and how to deal with it all right all right okay yes so you've got this is an interesting um an interesting thing so you've got a, a it's a little bug you can see there's a little bit of damage in the foliage there it's old old damage now this this is something that um the only way to really treat it successfully is to get the hose out and actually wash it away um, it will come off quite quickly and um, it's part of the breeding cycle. So there's eggs inside there. So you want to um, want to wash that away as quickly as you possibly can. It's um, it's sort of the four, 
but the forerunner to quite a significant problem later on. Hopefully that helps, Glenn. It's a bit of a different one. And Shelley is in Brisbane uh, in Queensland. I would like to, I would like the best way to get rid of a Billy Goat's weed and cobbler's pegs from a paddock, please. Shelley, it's going to be a selective herbicide. Um, if you've got a paddock size, you are going to need to go to a commercial stockist of agricultural chemicals and the name, specific name of the chemicals, uh, I couldn't tell you. So you need to seek advice. They're, they're very specific weeds and certainly garden herbicides are not going to do the job for you. So hopefully that helps. Um, this is our last week of the Garden Gurus on Channel 9 for the Autumn Series. We've got a fantastic show coming up for you. Here's a little preview of what's coming up this weekend. If you're after a high impact maintenance free plant, then check this one out. This is Carex Feather Falls, and it has this beautiful variegated evergreen foliage year round. And as you can see, it's spilling out of this pot and that's thanks to its cascading growth habit. And it makes a beautiful plant for an entertainment area. The benefits of plants and green spaces in our cities is truly remarkable. Improved air quality, less pollution, and cooling of temperatures counteracting the urban heat island effect. When it comes to pruning and when you're cutting timber down to size for a fireplace, you need the right tool. And whilst once upon a time a handsaw may have done the job, well, we don't need those compromises anymore because we've got the technology on our side. <laughs> we're having a few little technical challenges today. We're not quite sure what's causing them, but uh, look, we've run out of time. It's, I can't believe it, an hour has flown. We've built through a whole bunch of questions. We've covered off all sorts of things, including roses pretty thoroughly today. I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Now, remember, if you want to share this with your friends, just hit the like button, it really helps us. And uh, we're really sorry if we didn't get to your question today. We've done our very best. We'll collect those questions and we'll bring them into next week's show as well. Um, Robin is going to send a message through to our seed winners after today's show. Thank you very much for your questions. And, and I am not going to be back next Monday for another session of the Garden Gurus because I'm off to Canada today. Um, so I'll be filming uh, the Explore TV series over there. So I'm assuming that we're going to have Joe in next week, I would think. Yes, so Joe's joining us and uh, she is a fountain of knowledge. You will love that for sure. Remember, we are live at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern, Day, uh, Eastern Standard Time this time of the year and 10 a.m. for WA viewers. Um, don't forget to get your photo submissions or videos in via Facebook this Wednesday. Remember to state your name. The state and suburb really does help us. And, um, and, and yeah, send them through and we'll get them up and we can sort of look at those photos as we're going along. If you want any more information, you can always jump onto our website, thegardengurus.tv. It's a wonderful resource, as is our YouTube channel, which is thegardengurus.tv as well. So you can check that out. And of course, you can listen back to anything from today's show um, via our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Audible. And don't forget to tune into Channel 9 this Saturday. Pretty sure it's 4.30 p.m., but check your local guides. You'll catch episode 15. It's the last episode of the Garden Gurus Autumn Series. It'll be a lot of fun. And I'll be thinking of you next week whilst I'm away, working really hard somewhere up in the Rocky Mountains. Hope you have a wonderful week. Happy gardening. This live stream is brought to you by Still and Evergreen Garden Care. Still is Australia's most trusted brand of garden power tools backed by 95 years of German engineering excellence. To get your hands on their range, visit your local still dealer today or visit still.com.au. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail ordering service, offering a wide range of quality gardening products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.